my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen and I have been working together for the last two or three years on test-related research. I have to admit, I have a cheat sheet here because when you have a, a resume that's 54 pages long, it gets kind of hard to remember some of the, the more notable things uh, he has done. So Dr. Cohen is a professor of psychiatry and neurology and neuro uh, therapeutics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He's a Pamela Blumenthal Distinguished Professor of Clinical Psychology. Um, and also as a director of neuropsychology at UT Southwestern. He started his undergraduate education in Tacoma, Washington, progressed to UT Austin uh, to complete his doctorate, and completed some postdoctoral work at the VA Center at UC San Diego. Um, also, it's important to note that Dr. Cohen is director of the Alzheimer's Center at UT Southwestern. Uh, and some of, some of the more notable things I found in this lengthy document President of the American Psychological Association in regards to the neuropsychology division. He has an extensive funding background with incredibly large grants, multiple R01 grants, which have various aspects uh, related to his field. He has over 100 publications. I think the number is around 130 in the county. And lastly, he's the author of 30 book chapters and two books. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Monroe Collins. It's a pleasure to be here. I know we have a, a mixed group, uh, different disciplines represented, uh, and it's, it's, it's an honor for me to be presenting for you today. Uh, in case I break into some, uh, how many Texans, native Texans, do we have here? Oh, we have a bunch of native, Tex native Texans. Today we're going to be talking about uh, exercise and its effects on the brain in terms of what we know, there's a lot we don't know, which hopefully will stimulate some uh, research thinking as you're going through your coursework and planning your own uh, careers as well. Um, exercise has been getting a lot of uh, publicity over the last few years in particular uh, in relation to uh, brain function in both animals and humans. Uh, and today, uh, as far as a brief outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about a little brief rev review of the brain and how we measure the brain. Uh, and then we'll uh, get into uh, methods of assessment, and then we'll get into the, what's the literature on uh, looking at uh, exercise interventions to help support brain health. Um, does anybody in the room do any sort of online cognitive training, like Lumosity or anything? Do you guys do, do any of that? No. Well, you guys are well read. We, we don't know that stuff works, so you're probably doing better just to take, your, take the classes you're taking. That's good. Um, so, how, how many of you have uh, gone through a course where you've looked at neuroanatomy? A uh, good number. How many of you have actually done a, a brain dissection of some sort? Oh, whoa. We've got more people that have done brain dissections than have done a neuroanatomy in a course. That's interesting. <laughs> I don't want to hear more, but uh, uh, that's good. So, every, has ever, anybody seen a human brain in vivo? Uh, actually, it couldn't be probably in vivo, but a removed human brain. Okay, good. S so, okay. Okay, very good. All right, good. So, we're going to be talking about what, what people are looking at and what is the research to stimulate uh, the brain through exercise, what type of exercise might be useful, uh, what do we know and what do we don't know. Uh, since we're getting started a little bit late, I, I'm going to skip over some of the early uh, slides I had. But I was going to introduce, those, if you're Texans, you already know this, right? So I hope you've taught all of your friends and colleagues what a great term y'all is. Uh, it's very pithy, and it can be single or plural, right? And then if it's a big group, it's all y'all, right? So one of my other favorite Texas terms any, anybody use this term? Okay, good. Well, my favorite one is the last one here. It's a great one to use. If you've completely forgotten to do something, you can still say, I'm fixing to do it. So I, I tell my wife that all the time. Did you do this? I'm just fixing to. So it's, it's really great. And the last one, of course, is just big ol'. And if you got, a, it's just a wonderful descriptor, right? If, uh, and in fact, for today, I'm fixing to give y'all a big ol' talk about exercise and the brain. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we don't know probably than we know, but uh, we're going to review just a little bit of brain structure and function, and then we'll get on to the, uh, to the exercise uh, portions. So way back when, even Hippocrates uh, we talked about the brain being the center of, of all that we do, all that we know. Um, he talked about sports, in fact, uh, all relating to the brain. Now, he didn't talk about brain and physical activity being related necessarily. Uh, but those of you that have seen a human brain, you know that this three pound, roughly, three pound organ uh, is the center for everything we do. Everything that we think, everything we feel, everything we perceive. Uh, if we had you all hooked up to brain scans right now, those of you who are actually paying attention would have some activation in your left posterior hemisphere. Those of you that are texting or doing something else, I don't know where it would be lighting up, maybe occipital, uh, somewhere else. Uh, we know when we look at Einstein's brain, there are some uh, microscopic differences. Uh, some, he's got a few more folds here and there than the average person. But if you just look at him grossly, it doesn't look all that different uh, than any other brain. So we all look this, uh, similar. Uh, the basic synaptic transmission is, is the same throughout the brain in terms of the release of neurotransmitters, neurochemicals. It's how the brain communicates. Uh, you've all been through anatomy and physiology, so you know... Uh, about the synaptic uh, transmission and the importance of myelination and myelin fibers to conduct nerve impulses. And this I'm going to come back to later because it's actually relevant to our topic today. So uh, very important uh, neurologist, neuroethologist of our time, Tony Damasio, talked about how the, our mind, of course, where does the, you know, the mind is bigger than the brain. It's more than the sum of its parts. But he does talk about the, the history and circumstances of our experience and how that forms and helps modify our mind. So we are all products of our environments, obviously, and the environment and what we do in it uh, can have a big impact on uh, our development. Well, we know that uh, the, uh, the cerebral cortex is the highest level of evolution uh, in our species. If you look at other species, uh, they don't have the cortical uh, development that humans do. We have many, many more folds, which allows for a lot greater surface area, more brain cells than any other species. That's important. Uh, the brain is composed at last estimate of roughly 100 billion. We don't know how many neurons are there. Uh, 150,000 kilometers of myelinated nerve fibers connecting uh, the cells and over a quadrillion of synapses. So we wonder why computer models don't replicate the human brain, right? Well, it's, it's pretty complex. It's also ever-changing. So I mentioned earlier, it weighs about three pounds. Importantly for everybody here, especially those of you in kinesiology, it's using 15 to 20% of the entire oxygen supply, blood supply of the body, the brain alone. So it's, it's hungry for brain and blood flow. So the more blood flow we get to the brain, the more nutrients we're getting to the brain, glucose uptake, et cetera, uh, it's good for the brain. Now the other thing to keep in mind is the arterial system, the arterial supply of the brain. Uh, if we look at a, uh, a side view, you can see the, the frontal lobe of the brain here, the occipital there, the fine, fine and, and, and multifaceted uh, arteries, arterial system, if we look at an actual angiogram, you can see how feathery and fine-laced these arteries are feeding blood supply to the brain. And we know the brain can't go too long without oxygen. You have a problem if there's a stroke. And if, and if it's deprived of oxygen or nutrients for too long, parts start to die. Now, uh, so in terms of brain aging, wh why, how do we get there? Well, there's good news and bad news. And, of course, the bad news, every year we're losing neurons. Now, it doesn't apply to, to y'all that are under about age 25 as much to us people that are getting further along in the aging continuum. Uh, the greatest losses occur in the frontal lobes of the brain, the front part. Uh, microscopic changes. Uh, we've got a, a young nerve, uh, young dendrite here with the spines coming off of it, very healthy. You see all this nice arborization coming off of, of, the, uh, of the cell body. With aging, we don't have as many uh, spines off the dendrites, and it, the tree is a little less full, basically. Uh, 
that's a part of normal aging process. We just end up at the end of life with fewer brain cells, fewer connections than we have to start with. So the good news, we have a lot of neurons to spare. We've got even more synapses, right? Uh, and we now know that neurogenesis and synaptogenesis do occur in the adult brain. When I was in graduate school just three years ago, no, I'm kidding, it was longer ago than that, uh, so 20, 30 years ago, we were taught that once there's damage to the brain or a neuron is injured, that's it. There's no chance for it to come back, regenerate, you're done. Now we know there actually is an opportunity for neurogenesis even in the adult brain. So how do we stimulate the brain? How do we measure the brain? And uh, what do we do to look at effects of exercise on human performance? So we can gr get great neuroimages of the brain now. Uh, if you all recognize the frontal lobe up here, the cerebellum here, which is a major important motor center for, for uh, coordination, and balance, etc. Corpus callosum is the uh, nice band of white matter attaching the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, we can get really good pictures of the brain. In fact, you can get an MRI almost anywhere now. This was in a small Texas town. We saw next to the Washeteria, you, it's an open MRI. I don't know if you can read that. but So you can get a brain scan done just about anywhere. With the normal aging process, we do lose gray matter and we lose some white matter. The, the uh, white matter loss is not as much as the gray matter loss, but it does occur in men and women. Uh, you can see, uh, guys, it's a, it's a little, little, little steeper for us, but not by much. Um, but that's the course of normal aging. We lose about 28% of frontal cortex cells uh, it, by the time that we're in our 80s or 90s. Uh, losing less in the occipital primary motor cortex regions. So the biggest losses are in the frontal, frontal lobes of the brain. When we get to a, a disease state like Alzheimer's disease, these uh, cellular losses are much more massive throughout the cortex. Uh, you can see about 50% loss pretty much everywhere throughout the brain. So we do see differences between normal aging and uh, Alzheimer's disease. This can be uh, demonstrated nicely on uh, MRIs also. Front part of the brain, the back part of the brain. You see these cerebral ventricles in here. Uh, this is a healthy 70-year-old. Uh, the lateral ventricles here. You see how the much enlarged ventricles. You see here uh, the internal spaces that are filled with fluid. You see the uh, enlargement of the sulci around the perimeter of the, uh, of the brain. Uh, so as the brain wastes away uh, in Alzheimer's disease, it leaves more uh, uh, room for fluid expansion and volume expansion. <laughs> and with modern imaging, you never know what you're going to see. Uh, and sometimes you can see a lot of atrophy. So neuropsychologically, so my background, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training. Uh, spent a couple years doing a postdoctoral fellowship, so we get exposure to clinical neurology clinical psychology, neurology, neuroscience, and we develop tests and use tests to measure brain function. So, for example, we use uh, lists of words to measure memory. Uh, how, how many of these items uh, can somebody name if we uh, tell them to them now? And I show you this list of things later. How many are you actually remembering correctly? How many are you forgetting? Uh, are you getting in the right semantic category? Thank you. Oh, it's going to work. I will be able to talk to people after lunch now. That's good. Everybody hear me okay? Thank you, sir. You bet. Um, so we have developed a, a lot of standardized tests that actually measure human brain function. And it's these tests that are the ones that are sensitive to, uh, to aging and to pathologic states as well. And of course, when we're talking about memory function, the hippocampus is the key structure for the acquisition uh, and, and retention of new memories. It's, it's a key structure. And again, I'm, I'm mentioning that for a very specific reason because that's very important for today's talk as well. Now there's also, uh, there's bad news and good news about cognitive aging as well as brain aging structurally. We see declines in a variety of uh, processes, although some functions uh, maintain their stability pretty well. Uh, a few things actually increase like vocabulary skills, uh, a, a difficult to measure uh, concept such as wisdom. That's why you go to your grandparents if you really want to get, get the most wisdom out of, out of things. You're probably not going to be talking to your little brother or little sister for true wisdom and, and advice along those lines, I hope. Uh, if we look at the cognitive trajectories with age, you see that executive functions, 
memory, speed of processing show these declines. Other crystallized abilities uh, like vocabulary skills actually show some nice improvement. Uh, many things though start going downhill in the early 30s. That's the bad news. But the good news is even if you're dropping to here, we're still doing okay. So you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry. Uh, if we look at the at, uh, patient's ability to learn a uh, complex uh, list of items uh, over time, you see that the normal aging people still show a, a same healthy curve. It's just at a little bit lower level. Uh, so they're just not as quite as efficient, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a huge difference with normal aging. Uh, now when we get to the situation of Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment, that transition stage between normal aging and Alzheimer's, you see that the, the, uh, the learning curve uh, drops significantly so that they're only learning a couple of items and then they hit a plateau very quickly and don't learn much. And then they also, the bad news is that they, they also, uh, they don't remember much. You can see that the uh, patients with Alzheimer's are recalling very little, but the uh, healthy, normal uh, folks are recalling most of, of the words that they initially learned. And that's the normal aging process. So when we get to the, to the brain and exercise, what do we know? Well, way back when, even before my time, uh, in the early 60s, there were, there were nice studies of rats and rodents raised in uh, enriched environments. They had one cage, uh, they just had like nothing, just the uh, metal wire on the floor, kind of like the old Harry Harlow monkeys. Uh, they, uh, they, they, just a very unstimulating environment, bland uh, coverings of the, uh, of the cage. And in another cage, they would have an enriched environment, things for them to, to interact with, uh, things that move, things to play with, things to look at. Uh, and they actually showed in, uh, enhanced dendritic arborization in the brain cells of these mice, even back then. Uh, increased synaptic dens density was also seen in the 70s. Uh, and actually, then in the 1990s, we saw evidence of regrowth of cells in the human hippocampus and in the rat hippocampus. Uh, and that was some of the first indication that we had of the brain's ability to generate new cells in adulthood was actually in the hippocampus, which is, of course, as we talked about, the site of uh, new learning and acquisition of information. So there have been some really novel studies done of, uh, of mice on treadmills, uh, running wheels, uh, showing that uh, even if they, they lesion a mouse, uh, or a rat in, in the nucleus basalis of minor, which is an area key for uh, the cholinergic neurons. Uh, it's also key in the, uh, 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 it's being looked at a lot as a potential major source of dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. They lesion this in, in mice, but then put them in an active uh, exercise program. Uh, the mice can actually regain some uh, skills. Their memory may improve and they show uh, improved uh, 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 cellular uh, generation actually with age. Now in terms of, I, I jump quickly to humans because I'm just not a rat guy. I had one as a pet, but you know, it wasn't that much fun. So uh, in humans, uh, th there was just uh, this uh, past year, a fascinating study, randomized controlled trial. So you, those of you doing research know what that's talking about. So it's kind of the highest level of research you can do where it's really, really well controlled. Uh, they took uh, 120 subjects uh, and they put one group into uh, an actual exercise program, physical exercise with some aerobic activity, and another group uh, as a control that just got a stretching training. So they, they couldn't just leave them and do nothing, right, because you've got to account for some uh, experiment-wise effect. And they actually showed uh, increased uh, uh, BDNF and improved spatial memory in the people that got the exercise training. Now what was very interesting was uh, neuroanatomically, there were no changes in, in gross brain structure, brain volume, et cetera, but the hippocampus actually showed a, an increase in size in the active exercise group. The exercise had its main effect on the anterior portion of the hippocampus, which is the key area for acquisition of new information, new learning. The posterior showed a slight increase, but not as much. Uh, so this is one of the first demonstrations uh, 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 in a randomized uh, controlled trial of exercise having an effect on human brain structure. 
some of my colleagues uh, at UT Southwestern and the Exercise Institute of uh, Medicine at Presbyterian Hospital also have looked at uh, white matter integrity. So white matter, it, that's the myelin, right? That's the connective tissue that makes up a lot of our brain. And if we look at these two uh, brain images, again, the front and the back, here's the ventricles, uh, you see some of these little white spots. Uh, these are called white matter hyperintensities. We used to call them, when I was in graduate school, UBOs, or unidentified bright objects. We didn't really know what they were. Uh, we still actually don't. Uh, it's probably areas of, 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 uh, of some degree of ischemia, uh, maybe infarction if it's larger, but it's not a clear stroke. And some of them are really, really tiny, and you'll just see little teeny areas of, of punctate uh, white matter hyperintensities that accompany the normal aging process. So about 25% of healthy individuals over the age of 50 are going to have some of these white spots. Uh, now, if you have a bunch of them, uh, it can be associated with lower cognitive functioning as well. And in fact, when we looked at a uh, group of master athletes, those, these are the marathon runners. Uh, now, it's not a huge sample. I, I think we only had 15 or 20 of them. Uh, it, so these are lifelong athletes, uh, marathon runners for, forever. Now they're in their 70s. We compared them to a group of sedentary elderly, and we looked at those white matter differences in the brain. And this is the distribution of the white matter uh, uh, hyperintensities. Very, very low in the master trained athletes and much higher in the sedentary group. Now there is overlap, and you're always going to see overlap between uh, pathological groups and almost any groups in normal aging because aging is associated with such a, a wide variety of, of variability in, in function uh, as well as brain structure. We also found that uh, focal regions of the brain were actually a bit larger in the master athletes than in the sedentary elderly. Uh, now, when we looked at their cognitive function, we didn't see as much, and you won't be able to probably see this, uh, all these numbers, but we did a lot of neuropsychological tests. So though any, of the, any of you that have taken a neuropsychology course, you know we love to test the brain, because you can't just give one test and tell how somebody's doing. You've got to give te tests of attention, concentration, memory, processing speed, language, nonverbal ability, et cetera. We only found a couple of differences uh, just on measures of verbal fluency. Uh, so fluency tasks are where you just have a, somebody generate as many words as they can think of that begin with a specific letter. And the master athletes were a little bit higher in that. That's the only difference. So we did not see a significant cognitive difference between these groups in lifelong athletes uh, versus uh, sedentary folks. I mentioned the BDNF uh, story uh, earlier in the mice, and I, actually as some of you uh, kinesiology majors will know, you do see an, in, in, an increase in BDNF following rigorous exercise in, in healthy adults as well, and that has been seen uh, in studies of the elderly uh, as well. So it's, it's a little bit less than you see in younger adults, but it does still occur. We think that BDNF uh, as a nerve growth factor may be something that's helping to stimulate particularly hippocampal uh, regeneration and hippocampal uh, cell growth. Now, somebody was asking me earlier about you know, is, is jogging or walking better, and actually there was a really nice and very large study, uh, 2,200 uh, 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 aging people from, uh, from the 1990s in the Honolulu Aging Study. Uh, they followed up to see uh, how many people got demented and how many uh, stayed uh, cognitively intact. And the, it was the, the subjects with the highest amount of walking were, had a, a two-fold less incidence of dementia as they aged. Uh, again, the, uh, most of these are correlational studies, so there may be other factors, uh, but even once you control for things like reports of, of, of diet and other aspects of health, the effect of exercise uh, still tends to remain. Uh, another uh, really novel uh, project uh, looked at uh, almost 2,000 uh, healthy uh, New Yorkers, basically, um, and they looked at what type of diet they ate as well as how much they exercised. Now, again, these are just patient or subject ratings of diet and exercise. So they had uh, the high, uh, the good diet was uh, closer to the Mediterranean diet. A bad diet was far away from that, so more fatty foods and whatnot. Uh, then there was high, middle, and low exercise ratings as well. 
282 out of the 1,800 developed Alzheimer's disease, which is not an un unsuspected or surprising rate. Mean age was almost 80. It was a pretty low education group, actually, for a lot of our normal aging studies. And uh, as I mentioned, they also completed high and low uh, physical uh, activity and diet ratings. And these results were adjusted for a variety of factors, uh, including the apolipoprotein E, uh, caloric intake, as misspelled, uh, body mass index, leisure activity, smoking history, everything they could think of were statistically controlled uh, and they wanted to see what the effects were on, of exercise and diet. So this, this top line here was the high physical activity, uh, high diet, i.e. more Mediterranean type of diet, uh, lots of uh, omega-3s, things like that. And the bottom line is the low activity, low diet score. Uh, and on the, uh, on the left here is the cumulative probability of them remaining dementia free. So the people up here, they had, uh, if I'm looking at that right, about a 70% chance of being dementia free. And these guys were only about a 50% chance of uh, dementia free in the combination exercise and diet. Uh, again, just published a few years ago, suggesting once again that, that exercise seems to have an effect. The other thing that we've actually known even longer uh, is that uh, exercise has been a beneficial effects on mood. Um, so, for example, back in the 1970s, it was observed that patients who were depressed, if they were simply given a uh, walking regimen or an activity uh, regimen, as opposed to being just sitting there, that they're actually, they showed significant improvements in mood. And, uh, of course, the pendulum is swinging back, and, and for a while this literature was ignored. Now we're seeing actually clinical trials being funded by the NIH to study exercise in mood disorders. Uh, we also know that in uh, patients uh, who are undergoing cancer treatment, exercise helps their mood as well, may in fact have some beneficial effects on recovery, such that some people are actually describing exercise as a drug or an actual intervention now. It's, being, it's becoming considered in some circles as something that is prescribed much as you'd go to a, a doctor and get a prescribed medication. So I think uh, exercise is really coming into its own. Uh, of course, you all already knew that, being in kinesiology and, and movement disorders and, and movement sports and whatnot. Now, the other question that comes up is, what about cognitive exercise? Does mental stimulation have an effect? Uh, is the effect similar to physical, physical exercise, or what are the differences? This was a, uh, a review of the literature that concluded uh, they, they feel that maintaining an intellectually engaged and physically active lifestyle is good for you. Well, duh, right? I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, the more mentally challenged, uh, I don't mean mentally challenged in a bad way, I meant mentally challenging that, that, you, that you keep yourself, that is, keep learning new things every day, it's probably good for you, as opposed to sitting there and staring at a wall or just playing video games all the time. Um, so there have been a couple of nice studies looking at uh, lifespan cognitive activity and cognitive aging. Uh, this is a longitudinal investigation where they ended up with almost 300 subjects where they, uh, that came to autopsy uh, and underwent neuropathological study. And the main finding was that more frequent cognitive activity across the lifespan, again this is just based on uh, uh, self-rated levels of cognitive uh, uh, activity, uh, uh, including uh, leisure activity, uh, occupational activity, uh, et cetera, was associated with slower cognitive decline with normal aging, even after they controlled for all sorts of neuropathologic burden. So they took into account uh, these white matter abnormalities, uh, pathological findings in the brain, beta amyloid, tau, uh, tangles, uh, cerebral plaques, all these things that contribute to cognitive impairment later in life. Some of these may be causative or involved in the process of, of Alzheimer's disease. Even controlling for all that, the uh, cognitive activity across the lifespan still showed uh, uh, a difference between uh, those that became demented and those did not. Even in terms of early lifespan uh, cognitive activity. So those that were more 
intellectually engaged uh, in academics when they were kids had better outcomes. Uh, especially in old age, there was a bigger effect. Much a smaller effect in, in young adulthood and in middle age, but it, it suggested that this cognitive activity, if you develop it early and continue that throughout your life, especially engaging in it uh, big time uh, once we get older, is a really, really good thing, separate from physical exercise as well. Now when we go for uh, some of the large literature reviews uh, that are out there, the, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Cochrane database system. They get experts in the field uh, to, to summarize uh, literature uh, in different areas. And uh, this was one that was uh, done a few years ago. They looked at 11 studies of aerobic exercise. Uh, eight of them reported increased uh, fitness and some aspect of cognition, with the biggest effects uh, that being on cognitive speed, delayed recall, attention, but there was no consistent finding across studies. So one study found that uh, the, uh, the elder people uh, sped up a little bit in their reaction times, uh, but then the next study found that they actually improved on a memory test, but not reaction times. So the, the results have really been different across studies. Now all these studies have used different tests, and different outcome measures, that may be part of it. Uh, so the conclusion was that the overall data are insufficient to show clear improvements in cognition that were clearly attributable to exercise. Uh, but exercise was related to cardiovascular fitness. Not surprising. Uh, an, no, um, another uh, conclusion from this uh, review was that it was still unknown whether this sort of fitness is necessary for improved cognitive function. So aerobic activity improves cardiovascular fitness, but what's most important for cognition? We don't yet know. Uh, a more recent Cochrane review uh, found that memory training resulted in improvements, uh, but they didn't get any better than the control groups that were looked at. No specific memory training effects could be ascribed to specific cognitive interventions, and they found little evidence of big effects, uh, but again, the, the literature here is just a mess. So as you're developing your careers, hopefully you will be designing uh, much uh, more tightly controlled uh, studies and investigations that allow us to separate uh, some of these, uh, these findings. Oop, I keep pushing the wrong button. So uh, what about uh, implications for Alzheimer's? As everybody gets older, uh, you know, obviously age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it goes up with age a lot. Um, so there was a uh, nice uh, publication in 2010 from the NIH, uh, uh, it was a consensus panel on Alzheimer's disease, looking at all the known and possible risk factors that had been reviewed and reported in the literature. Their conclusion was that it was promising, but they also felt that the evidence was insufficient to convincingly, and I'm going to underline convincingly here, support modifiable factors such as exercise, cognitive stimulation, and diet as truly being preventive. Now, the evidence is not convincing, but it is mounting, it is growing, it is supportive. Uh, but it, it does not meet uh, strict uh, scientific criteria. I mentioned the, the frequency of Alzheimer's uh, going up with uh, uh, normal aging. This is in millions of people. You know, if we look at us uh, here in 2013, there's about 4.7 million uh, Americans uh, affected uh, with Alzheimer's disease. As we get older as a population, that's going to grow so that it's going to be a bigger, bigger problem. So we've got to discover some techniques and interventions that help stave off this illness. Uh, and obviously with age being the big risk factor,